vote on any of the questions. And um, also you can use the chat function to send any thoughts as well. But, but we do ask you to put all the questions in the Q&A. Um, and now it, I'd like to welcome uh, Wendy Herbert, our president and CEO, uh, to begin the event. Over to you, Wendy. Thanks, Ryan. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our showcase series uh, focusing on Prince George today. Thank you all for joining us. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining this event from within the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salitut First Nations. I'd also like to acknowledge that others are joining us from across traditional and unceded Indigenous territories from across the province and the country, including the Clayton-Latine First Nation, part of the Dahlia, where most of our presenting speakers are from. We're excited to be here to host this event virtually. Over the past year and a half, I guess it is now, Life Sciences BC and our community have fortunately embraced virtual events. We're grateful that we can still continue to discuss and draw attention to the extraordinary work being done in the life sciences sector across BC and today very specifically in Prince George. For those that do not know, Life Sciences BC is a not-for-profit society. Our members consist of academic and research institutions, local and global companies operating in the life sciences space in digital health, med tech, devices, diagnostics, therapeutics, and those companies that provide support and services to the broad life sciences ecosystem. We're funded through membership and the generous contributions of our sponsors and partners. This event was made possible by the support of our event partner, Michael Smith Health Research BC, and our speaker partners, Clinical Trials BC and the University of Northern British Columbia. Thank you very much. Your investment in Life Sciences BC and the ecosystem broadly is invaluable, and we're grateful for that. At each event, we like to share and introduce our latest new members. So today we'd like to welcome Boreal Genomics, H2O um, Therapeutics, and BD, uh, SFU School, um, BD School of Business. We're always welcoming new members, so please reach out to us at any time, either uh, directly to one of us or through our website for more information. So we're excited to be here for today's event. I can tell you that the presentations are going to be very interesting um, as we've worked uh, with the presenters to hear about what they want to talk about today. We're going to look at cutting edge research and development and some very innovative programs and, um, and activities that are happening in the Prince Storage area. So I'd like to now invite Shanetta Jones to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Wendy, and good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the newly consolidated organization, Michael Smith Health Research BC. Jointly founded by Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research and the BC Academic Health Science Network. It's with respect and humility that we acknowledge our offices are located on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and that our work extends across many indigenous lands and territories across British Columbia. As a newly consolidated organization, Michael Smith Health Research BC is looking forward to continuing our work with communities and partners to strengthen research capacity across the province, to support evidence-informed decision-making in healthcare, to increase the competitiveness of our life sciences sector, and to maximize the social and economic benefits of health research in BC. So on that note, we want to express our deep thanks to Life Sciences BC for this opportunity to highlight the vibrant research in life sciences in Prince George. As BC's health research agency, we do recognize the importance of fostering health research capacity in all regions of BC to advance research relevant to all communities and to leverage the unique strengths of each region to ultimately benefit the province as a whole. It's absolutely essential that we support research that is important to local communities and that we support local researchers and that we work in partnership to strengthen local health research capacity in every region across the province. Since 2005, Health Research BC has given $11.3 million through 47 awards to researchers based in Northern BC. Over the last five years, the North has had a funding success rate for Michael Smith Health Research BC awards that was higher than our average funding success rate for all institutions. And we found that this success has been driven by exceptional applicants from the North 
to our scholar and research trainee programs. We also actively support patient engagement and research through the BC Support Unit Northern Center in Prince George, but we want to increase the regional diversity of our funding programs by funding more researchers in Northern BC. We've consulted with regional colleagues and partners to implement process changes to our scholar and research training programs intended to improve the success of all regional applicants. And we are now accepting applications for our programs. Please do see our website for more information. So it's with extreme pleasure that I have the, the opportunity to introduce Health Research BC scholar, Dr. Sarah DeLeo, co-supported by the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health. Sarah is a professor at the Northern Medical Program at, uh, Geography at UNBC. She founded the Health Arts Research Center in the Northern Medical Program at U UNBC. She is a multidisciplinary feminist, an anti-colonial scholar, activist, and writer studying why some people and places have better health than others, particularly how creative arts and humanities in medicine and healthcare hold potential for disrupting coloniality and activating strength-based solutions to health inequities. And because of her exceptional contribution, Sarah was appointed Canada Research Chair in 2017 to the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists. And I understand she's here today to talk about her work that uses art-informed activities to improve the well-being of people in rural and remote BC communities. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction and an incredibly kind commitment to research in Northern British Columbia. It's a real pleasure to be the first speaker in this Prince George Showcase series organized by Michael Smith Health Research BC and Life Sciences BC. A huge thank you to all of you who've convened here today. As a poet and health humanities researcher who attends to health inequities by addressing placism, by which I mean the privileging of urban geographies over rural and remote geographies, and to colonialism, by which I mean the privileging of usually white European ways of knowing and being over other experiences and knowledge, I'm gonna kick us off today with a short piece of poetry. A piece of poetry by the first ever Indigenous Woman Poet Laureate of the United States of America, Joy Harjo. Harjo opens her 2017 poem, Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings, with the stanza, recognize whose lands these are on which we stand. Ask the deer, turtle, and the crane. Make sure the spirits of these lands are respected and treated with goodwill. The land is a being who remembers everything. You will have to answer to your children and their children and theirs. By listening, we will understand who we are in this holy realm of words. Do not parade pleased with yourself. You must speak in the language of justice. With that in mind, I want to tell you I am joining you from grounds stolen from the Silks people. And I divide my time between Okanagan Territory and Tlitle Tene Territory in so called Northern British Columbia. In 2012, I became the first Michael Smith scholar working in geographies north of Vernon. I remain deeply hopeful thankful to the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health, who, along with the Northern Medical Program and UNBC, supported my research agenda of understanding how creative arts and the humanities can inform well-being in the places that I know of and call home. Health humanities, for those of you unfamiliar with the concept, is an area of study that brings disciplines like medicine, nursing, epidemiology, and health sciences into conversations with humanities disciplines like history, literary studies, philosophy, and even theology. Health humanities are increasingly integrated into medical and health science training and practice because of their proven capacity to increase research, education, clinical, and innovation skills. Understanding arts as fundamental to health has always felt utterly intuitive to me. Better health, of course, involves better communication, which is an art. Addressing determinants of health like social exclusion, racism, sexism, heteronormativity, all require that people feel differently about other people and communities. This feeling requires hard 
heart work done best with tools gleaned from arts and humanities as opposed to purely bench science. Effective translation and dissemination of cutting edge health and medical knowledge requires aesthetics and creativity, both of which are the domains of artists, writers, and humanities scholars. In the almost decade since I began my program of research, the Canadian Association of Health Humanities has been established, the Health Arts Research Centre in, in the Northern Medical Program in Prince George has directly trained dozens of master's students, PhDs, postdocs, residents, and medical students for practice directly in northern, remote, and rural places. At least five groundbreaking textbooks in medical and health humanities have been published in the last five years alone, all of them making the key point that health and medicine are as much an art as they are a science. In early 2021, the American Association of Medical Colleges, AAMC, announced a national United States commitment to health humanities, noting that, quote, the integration of arts and humanities into medicine and medical education may be essential to educating a healthcare workforce of tomorrow that can effectively contribute to optimal healthcare outcomes for patients and for communities. I'm sad to say that no such national commitment exists in Canada. In the growing conversations about health humanities around the world, however, understandings about critical health humanities are lacking. There's a gap about bringing gender and women's studies, critical anti-racism, settler colonial studies, and queer studies into medicine and other health sciences. So I am absolutely committed to using critical health humanities to address pressing issues like racism, fat phobia, sexism, placism, and colonialism. I believe health humanities have the potential, in Joy Harjo's words, to ensure health and medicine speak the language of justice. With the language of justice guiding us, a team of 80 and or more people around the world is currently assembling under the umbrella title, Heal Medicine. Our goal is to transform healthcare in Canada. We're committed to first, igniting and sustaining a national conversation about critical anti-colonial health humanities into medicine and health. And we're aiming to develop and create evidences about anti-colonial health humanities curriculums for all 17 Canadian faculties of medicine across the country. I'm going to just stop sharing and bring up a video and we're going to play a two and a half minute video so you can get a taste of this. I'm just quit decolonizing leadership stories as data healing our workplaces healing ourselves. The arts and medicine have the potential to instill critical consciousness to help make healthcare safer for patients and providers. It means an opportunity to catalyze action that leads to meaningful change to bring the care back into healthcare. Humanities in medicine means asking critical questions. To bring together people through listening and polyphonic narratives. It takes into account uh, intersectionalities to better understand how people make sense of the meaning in their lives. Better healthcare through better medical education. Shifting the focus from evidence to people. Arts and medicine have the power to heal the sick in novel and powerful ways. We can bring our full humanity into healthcare. The need for social justice, humanities and cultural sensitivity has never been greater than now. Poetry, innovation, equity, education, community. Invite clinicians to feel transformational arts sharing our humanity radically rethinking what we do to help our patients reconciliation decolonization 
healing, survival. Humanity is as a pedagogical tool throughout health professions, education, well care through a different lens. Bringing work from this project into conversations with colleagues in Africa, Asia, and South America, with whom I work using a decolonial framework. To see each other as worthy of care. Supplementing science with creativity, collaboration, and empathy. Educational practices for health equity is our reality. The potential to address social justice issues in intersecting ways, including ableism, racism, and colonialism in all walks of life. As a trans person, arts and medicine is a way of communicating and connecting that we really need to survive. So I just want to wrap up by saying thanks uh, to everybody who convened us today. And um, I'll leave you with one last slide, uh, just possibly what you may be able to do in your everyday lives to integrate um, health, uh, arts and humanities into medicine, health research, um, and your own daily practices. I hope that I stayed on time. Look forward to any questions being dropped in the Q&A area. And uh, again, huge thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. That was a um, very interesting presentation and such an important initiative. Um, very powerful. Um, so thank you for the work that you're doing and for, for sharing it with us. I'd now like to invite Alison Orth, the Unit Director of Clinical Trials BC, from Michael Smith Health Research BC, to introduce our next speaker. Over to you, Alison. Thank you, Wendy. Hi, everyone, and thank you to Life Science BC for um, inviting us here today and as a partner in this uh, showcase series. We always enjoy being um, a partner in this series and going around the province to showcase um, the clinical research and clinical trials that are happening. And we're really thrilled to be able to um, present uh, the speaker from Prince George today, who is Dr. Rob Olson. But first, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about Clinical Trials BC. We are a unit within Michael Smith Health Research BC, and we support clinical trial investigators, sites, and institutions to ensure a world-class destination for clinical trials. We focus on infrastructure and capacity building with a collaborative approach and work to enable clinical trial excellence in the province of BC. We do that um, by working in uh, provincial, national, international clinical research communities and, and connecting with governing bodies and forums. And some of the areas of our focus are clinical research navigation, industry liaison for the province, talent development and training at the investigator site and institution, regulation and quality assurance for the conduct of clinical trials. And we also work to improve uh, patient engagement and participant experience in clinical trials. Areas of focus include program development and support, such as provision of a clinical trial management system to the health authorities, including Northern Health, and provision of SOPs and quality management programs that can be adapted to local contexts. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Rob Olson. Hi, Rob. Rob is a radiation oncologist who practices in Prince George. He completed his Bachelor of Science in MD at the University of Calgary, his res residency at UBC, and a Master of Science in Epidemiology at Harvard. He is both the Provincial Division Head of Radiation Oncology and Associate Head Research in the Department of Surgery at UBC and the research lead for the Northern Medical Program. His clinical practice is focused on breast cancer, cancer, head and neck cancer, and treating metastatic disease with advanced radiotherapy techniques. His research is predominantly focused on the running of clinical trials of precision radiotherapy in the metastatic setting. And Rob, I'm really excited to hear your talk today. I know this was one that we actually had scheduled for last year and rescheduled to this year, so thank you. And um, I understand the title of your talk is Leading Cancer Care Paradigm Shift Through Clinical Trials Run from Northern BC. Welcome over to you, Dr. Olson. Right. Thanks for the introduction. Um, 
Okay, so hopefully my slides are showing. Um, so just a quick disclosure, um, uh, there is a machine company that has funded some of the research I'm talking about. Um, so just as a background to a couple words that I'm gonna introduce that are probably not part of everyone's nomenclature. So Sabre is stereotactic ablative radiotherapy, which essentially is really high doses of radiotherapy delivered very accurately. Um, and so on the left is what conventional palliative radiotherapy would look like, sort of a rectangle, and you're limited by how much dose you can give because of, in this setting, the skin gets really hot, but if you're treating from the front and the back, also the bowels, you get nausea, you get vomiting, um, and so you get low doses because of it. But on in Sabre, you can give much higher doses as you're sculpting around the spinal cord or the, the nerves that come off the spinal cord in this level. Um, so it's one of the words. The next one is illegal metastases, which I use a fair bit in uh, talking. Um, so um, illegal essentially means few and metastases are cancer spread. So um, it's this potential area where cancer has started to spread, but not yet spread widely. Um, and historically that was treated with palliative chemotherapy, sometimes with radiation for symptom management, very rarely would you give surgery in that setting. Um, but more recently um, there's been more and more interest, especially with the advent of more effective chemotherapy, that maybe we should be treating um, these sites aggressively with local treatment as well. Um, and Sabre has ended up being probably the easiest one to do it with, or, or the one that you can do most safely. Um, surgery is also one of the options. And so we've actually led some of these trials. So um, um, this is one of the studies that BC accrued probably the most patients for um, is the landmark Sabre Comet trial. And we um, was published in the Lancet in, a couple of years ago now, very high profile within the radiation oncology community. Um, I would say possibly too high profile. Um, it was a randomized phase two study, which means um, it's a study um, that is looking to see if we should open up phase three studies. Um, but um, lots of commentary came out after it was published um, and even um, commentaries that are suggesting this would be a new um, cancer treatment paradigm already. Um, and so I would argue it's a little early because we designed the study to see if we should go to phase three. Um, the reason that there was so much excitement um, is because it looks like there's um, a, a strong survival advantage um, when you're giving um, Sabre treatment um, to people who have very few metastases. And most of them in the study had one, two, or three. Um, and so it actually is about a doubling of the overall survival at five years. So almost half of the patients um, who got the intervention were still alive five years later. And we have longer follow-up now, which shows us persisting. Um, but of course, the flip side is what about adverse events? Um, it's not like radiation comes with no toxicity. Um, and actually there was a tripling of the grade two or higher adverse events. Grade two is not very serious. That's usually like you know pain or nausea that doesn't require um, hospitalization, but does require some medication. Um, but there was, um, when you get to grade three, four, and five, it becomes more serious. And grade five is actually death as a secondary consequence. And there was actually three patients in the saber arm who passed away from potentially um, related toxicity. Um, so that led us to pause, um, even though there's a survival advantage, to make sure this is safe. And so in BC, um, unlike other jurisdictions, we decided not to allow treatment off trial. And so we designed um, a study called Sabre 5, which I led um, in BC only. Um, and what we did is we um, went through the rigorous process of making sure that everyone went through consent, explaining to patients this may be harmful, but we think it might be beneficial based on the original Sabre Comet study. Um, we also made a very rigorous program um, where we peer reviewed each other's work. Um, and so what that means is, say when I'm outlining the area, the tumor, and then outlining the areas at risk, like the spinal cord and that other picture, um, I get an individual say from Vancouver or Victoria to look at what I'd done and make sure that I had done it properly. Um, and then also when the physicists do it, the physicists get a physicist from other center um, to double check their work. So we had quite a, you know, a rigorous process that we set this up and our primary outcome was to look at quality of life and um, toxicity. Um, so um, although it wasn't randomized, just one arm, one of the biggest benefits is that it was population-based and that was the only way to get Sabre in our province. Um, and so it was four times the size of the original Sabre Comet study and uh, took four, four or so years to accrue. Again, I already said the primary outcome was 
um, toxicity. Um, and we had a very, um, again, rigorous approach to looking at this toxicity where we uh, independently um, had a toxicity review uh, community that looked at every single case that was above grade three or grade three or above. So the primary outcome um, is that it looks like it is um, a lower rate of toxicity than the original Staber Comet study, um, but there was still one death that was potentially related. Um, this is a very busy slide, which you don't need to read in detail, but it's just to show you that we are able, because we have a larger population, we can break it down by different um, sites and by different toxicities. So not really surprising in things like bone, there was pain, um, in spine, there was fracture. This is a known side effect from Sabre. Um, but then what was more unique is that uh, liver and adrenal glands were treated in a large enough number that we were able to see that there was other toxicity that was um, occurring that we need to do further research on. And so this is the one patient who had um, a death from radiation, which is sort of I'm using it as an allusion to why we need to go to phase three trials. So um, I had metastatic colon cancer to the liver to two spots. Um, one of them was actually very close to where the blood vessels um, come together, but also where the biliary tree exists. Um, and so there was stenosis um, of the biliary tree, um, which then required um, uh, a stent to be placed externally, and, and then that was a source of infection, um, which eventually led to um, multiple courses of antibiotics, different attempts at replacing things, um, and actual death. Um, but what complicates it a little bit in interpreting it is that on MRI, there may have been a recurrence in that area, um, suggesting that maybe it wasn't the saber that caused it, but that it could have been the tumor itself that was growing and pushed on this um, biliary tree. But um, we don't know, um, which is why you need randomized evidence. So the conclusions from the, the saber 5 study is that it looks like it's relatively safe in this really well-conducted study that was, you know, we provincially coordinated peer review and we had um, like a lot of quality controls um, built within it. And, and it was operated at all six BC cancer centers. Um, and the, the rates of, of toxicity were quite a bit lower than what we're seeing in, um, in the Sabre Comet study. Um, but again, with the example of the grade five study you, or the grade five um, toxicity, you can't tell um, what the natural history would have been without having a control group. And so this again, further um, supports us going into a phase three trials, um, which is what we're leading now. So um, we're leading the Sabre Comet three study um, from Prince George. Um, we, we have chosen not to have our staff that run the trials in Vancouver, although that would have been easier. Um, I decided to hire staff locally in the building I'm sitting right now um, uh, to, to run the, the trial um, because we want to build, build capacity in the north. Um, it's been funded by CHR and then that, um, that equipment company. Um, and there's 14 sites that are now open, um, including several across Canada, um, Scotland, Ireland, and Australia. And so patients are being randomized um, with a higher chance of being randomized to treatment, which helps with accrual, uh, two to one sort of ratio. Um, and we're almost at a fifth of patients being accrued. And then an important um, thing that has evolved in our funding um, is that we also applied for the inaugural funding for um, the Canadian Cancer Clinical Trials Network and had an initiative called CRAFT, which is the Canadian Remote Access Framework for Clinical Trials, which um, is something that I've been advocating for this concept for over a decade now. And it um, incredibly excited me when this became available um, by um, a national funding organization. Essentially what they've, they've done is they've given us funding to pilot um, having patients do their follow-up in community. So like obviously you, you can't give the, the Sabre treatment in Terrace uh, or in Trail, which is the two communities we've chosen, um, but we can um, train the local family doctors and clinical trials methodology and in doing the follow-up and all the paperwork. Um, and so we're actually trying to expand clinical trials being having to be in large centers or small centers like Prince George into even more remote communities. And eventually the idea would be we can move this into First Nations communities um, and others. So my final thoughts. Um, are that large high profile clinical trials can be led from small centers like Prince George. Um, all patients deserve access to clinical trials from large urban centers to small indigenous communities. Um, and now is the time for Northern Health um, to start opening more clinical trials and lead innovation in rural and remote health in partnership with people like myself at PHSA, which is BC Cancer as part of, UBC, UNBC and other partners, um, including indigenous communities. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to have you um, join today and give us an update on that um, that initiative. It's uh, wonderful to hear and look forward to hearing more about it and following it along. Um, I'd now like to introduce our final group of speakers, Dr. Kathy Lewis, Dr. Paul Winwood, and Dr. Julia Bickford. So I think you're all turning on your um, cameras. So that's great. So I'll just introduce each of them and then turn the floor over. So Kathy Lewis is currently Acting Vice President of Research and Innovation at UNBC. She's a, prof a professor, professional forester, and former chair of the Ecosystem Science and Management Program at UNBC. She teaches course, courses in forest health and researches the ecological roles of biotic disturbant agents in forests and the influence of management practices and climate change on forest health. She's also actively involved in outreach and community-based activities. So welcome, Kathy. Next is Dr. Winwood. He came to Canada from the UK in 2008 to continue his academic career with the Northern Medical Program and work as an internist and gastroenterologist at the University Hospital of Northern British Columbia. He graduated from the London Hospital Medical College in 1985 and completed postgraduate specialist training in internal medicine and gastroenterology at the University of Southampton, where he subsequently undertook research in pathogenesis of cirrhosis. He worked at the Royal Bournemouth Hospital through 1996 to 2008, where he was head of the Department of Gastroenterology and clinical tutor, director of medical education. After coming to Prince George in 2008, he became the site lead for internal medicine for the M NMP and head of the Department of Internal Medicine at UHNBC. He moved to his current position leading the NMP in 2012. Paul is a passionate advocate for physician training and addressing health needs in Northern and rural BC. I'm not sure I said your title at the beginning, so I'll say it at the end. Um, he's a Regional Associate Dean for Northern BC, UBC Faculty of Medicine, Associate Vice President, Northern Medical Program, University of Northern BC. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Julia Bickford, the Regional Director of Research Evaluation and Analytics at the Northern Health Authority and the co-lead of the BC Support Unit, Northern Centre. In these roles, Julia works in partnership with a variety of stakeholders to develop capacity and infrastructure in the North in support of a high quality evidence-based healthcare system. Julia has a PhD in Health and Rehabilitation Sciences and a master's degree in Medical Anthropology. She holds an innovation fellowship at the Institute for Health System Solutions and Virtual Care up from Women's College Hospital. Recent work has focused on digital health research and evaluation, knowledge mobilization, as well as cultural safety and indigenous experiences of healthcare. So I am now going to turn it over to these three esteemed amigos who will uh, lead us in their presentation. Over to you. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. We're really pleased to be here. Um, so Dr. Winwood is going to share our slides and I'm just gonna kick us off and we're gonna jointly um, present together today, the three of us. So we want to share with you a little bit about this new Northern Center for Clinical Research that is just emerging in the North. Um, but maybe before we dive into that, we'll go to the next slide. And I just wanna take a minute to situate this new center within the context um, of a learning health system or a learning health community. So we know that the development of new knowledge and innovation alone will not eventuate change in the health system. The health system needs processes and mechanisms to support system learning and to translate that new knowledge into innovation and, and improvement cycles within the health system. There's actually very little that's understood about these processes and the infrastructure that's needed. Um, and much of the literature on this comes out of the United States, which isn't always entirely applicable to our Canadian context. There is an article by Matt Manier and his colleagues in Quebec that is sort of growing um, traction within Canada. It's a Canadian example. And they looked across all of the literature on learning health systems and put together a framework that has six key pillars. Uh, so I wanted to just touch on each of those really quickly to kind of situate this center within these pillars. So the first is uh, technological. And so this area really includes a wide range of health technologies. This is the devices, the IT infrastructure and systems that um, are a key feature of learning health systems and our capacity to promote learning as a byproduct of everyday care. So this is really aligned with the idea that research is part of care and care is part of research. 
And it's made possible through this infrastructure, this technological infrastructure that enables our clinical data and our administrative data to be collected and aggregated and analyzed and then acted on. And then the next piece is around the scientific. So this includes academic, you know, research centers like the center <laughs> that we want to tell you about today that can really nurture and mobilize scientific expertise. It includes training programs and education activities that build the individual and collective expertise, um, in our case, in the North. So having individuals that can work as embedded researchers and scholars within the healthcare system can really accelerate the learning within these systems. The next area is the social area. So this is the people, the networks, the norms, the culture, the partnerships, the different social arrangements and the, the mechanisms for communication and collaboration at different levels and scales. So we want to dismantle the silos, we want to engage with community more, and we want to nurture cultures in which learning and improvement are integrated within normal operation. And again, we'll be talking about how this Northern Center for Clinical Research is embedded within a larger network of partnerships. The next piece is legal. And so again, this focuses on you know, legislation and laws that um, govern our healthcare institutions and our partner institutions as well. Then we have the ethical. This includes the frameworks and guidelines that support the learning health system. You know, especially helping stakeholders manage data ethically or to navigate the sometimes blurry boundaries between clinical practice and research and innovation. And then the final area is around policy. So the policy area recognizes that the goals that we pursue in a learning health system can't be achieved without adequate governance structures and policies, finance mechanisms, and those accountability measures. So each of these areas is critical, but it's not sufficient on its own. They need to be aligned um, in order to enable and foster learning within our health system. And that the idea is that when these are aligned, the health system will perform better on all of the areas within the quadruple aim. So you can see that on the right. I'm sure you're all familiar with this around the patient experience, improved provider experience, improved population health outcomes, and decreased healthcare costs. And so we'll just move to the next slide, if that's okay, Paul. Great. So this slide just talks a little bit about some of the gaps in our healthcare system. Um, and Dr. Olson's presentation really speaks to this as well. So we do have an established cadre of healthcare researchers in the North um, through the NMP and UNBC, and they're all connected to each other by this interest in our rural context, um, as again, Dr. Olson's presentation really highlighted. Um, but clinical research is, is developing. We've tried to make some strides in the last year or two, but there is a gap, um, and in particular outside of the cancer center in the north, um, and limited support for clinical trials especially. And then life sciences and biomedical research really also needs a home uh, and a connection with the clinical environment. So it would be a huge advantage for recruitment and retention, for example, in the north to have a more robust system to support clinical and biomedical research. We do have quite a shortage of health professionals in the north and offering more opportunities to engage in research would be a really positive step. And then most importantly, currently there's a, a gap for patients. Um, so building this clinical research infrastructure and capacity will enhance those care options for patients in the north. Um, so at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Paul, who's going to share some insights from researchers in the north about how this center might support their work. Thank you, Julia, and thank you for the kind introduction, um, praising our researchers in the North. And I think that our researchers punch above their weight, um, but they really have had challenges in the in the realm of clinical research. And Rob gave a great introduction to that. So I, I wanted to just share with you the experiences that a number of um, faculty within the NMP and UNBC have had and the sort of challenges they've had and how they think this research center uh, can support them. And um, so first of all, I'd like to tell you about Jackie Pettison, who is a, an academic uh, physician uh, who works um, with the Northern Medical Program and within the Division of Neurology uh, Department of Medicine at UBC. Um, she has been successful. She's won uh, international awards for her research on vitamin, on vitamin D and cognition. Uh, but she's also had many challenges along the way, um, particularly in the Northern health environment. And, and, and I don't want to be critical. In fact, Julia's done a great job of bringing things forward, but there is still a gap. So these are some of the things. So a lack of space, it's a simple thing. There is really no, no space 
um, in the Northern House Environment for research. Um, we, we, we did provide her with a bit of space in the teaching clinic uh, at UHMBC for a while, and then we provided her with some on campus at UNBC, but it's far from ideal uh, for, um, for, uh, for, you know, for clinical research and bringing patients up to campus is not, is not good. Um, so, you, so dedicated space is needed. She also cites a lack of clinical trial expertise and capacity, lack of policies and procedures. And Julia is fixing quite a lot of that stuff at the moment and, and has made great strides. As a consequence, uh, she had to abandon two studies, the COMPASS study, the secret trial that she could have participated in. Um, she has been running a vitamin D cognition trial that I just alluded to um, when I started speaking, uh, which, which has been successful, but it's been delayed. So um, there is a need to support infrastructure for clinical research within the healthcare environment in the North. And then, and this is a common theme, a lack of research personnel. And the way she's got around that is she's had to do the work herself and that's fine, but she's a PI and typically PIs have research assistants, research associates working with them, but it's hard, it's hard to get those folk. And as Rob said, we need to build capacity in the North to expand clinical research. Um, and then um, perhaps some more practical things, lack of access to imaging services. So she was involved in a mixed dementia project um, and, um, and had to abandon one of them uh, because she couldn't get access to imaging or she had to get it done in Vancouver. Um, and then lack of access to lab services. And again, she developed work around, she went out to life labs to get blood drawn and processed, uh, but it would be much more uh, it'd, be much, it'd be much more seamless and efficient if it could be done within the Northern Health environment. So that's Jackie. And then there's Denise Jaworski, who is, um, she's not an academic clinician. She is an internist working in Terrace. She's passionate about rural health research. Um, and she wanted to get involved in some COVID studies, uh, but she just found that the lack of capacity, particularly in her community, meant that she couldn't get involved in a critical care study that she was involved in. And she feels that what we can do to help there is to help build the partnerships with, um, with clinical trials units in the Lower Mainland. And actually, as we were um, uh, presenting this research center uh, to uh, the Faculty of Medicine, uh, we had a number of um, uh, center directors from the Faculty of Medicine contact us and say they would love to partner with us for clinical trials. So I think, I, I, you know, I think that will happen. Um, again, she talked to a lack of organizational policies and procedures, and, uh, and again, because of that, she's got a COVID observational study, which was delayed, but she is moving forward. And then again, this lack of research personnel that she needed to, to take forward a qualitative study. Next, I'd like to speak to the biomedical research. So this is Dr. Sarah Gray, who is a PhD, and she's um, a very successful uh, biomedical researcher who does research on obesity, diabetes, and uh, interestingly for the North on thermogenesis, how we keep warm. And um, she has an international reputation in this work. And, um, and yet it's, it's been a struggle for her to, um, to move things forward. And I, and, you know, and, I, and I don't want to undermine what she's done because she's really been hugely successful in a very difficult environment. And she, she makes the point that traditionally biomedical life sciences are conducted in large academic centers where there's a lot of core facilities, there's a critical mass of people, there's a community of practice, which is very limited in the North for researchers like Sarah. And she talks about academic isolation, that lack of access to core facilities, and again, the lack of highly qualified personnel. So she sees the center as having the potential to, for, to, to build that critical mass importantly to build a community of practice between researchers and clinicians because right now it's very hard for her to get access to uh, to a sort of human clinical material as it were and to take her research to the next step from bench to bedside she talks about shared resources for infrastructure uh, for research and again sample collecting processing and storage and then finally um, Dr. Shannon Freeman is an associate professor in the School of Nursing at UNBC. She has a very uh, successful project, the Center for Technology Adoption for Aging in the North, uh, which is bought, built on a partnership with Northern Health and AgeWell. Well. Um, and she has this pretty amazing uh, demonstration lab uh, located at UNBC. And again, she's been very successful, but for her, one of the challenges has been 
so the shepherding her research through ethics processes, it's been um, sort of having access, being able to contact patients who may participate in her research. So again, those are things that we believe the center can do uh, to, support, to support Shannon. So I will move on and I think it's gonna to go to Kathy. Great, thanks Paul. So this is the vision for the Northern Center for Clinical Research. And there's three things I'd like to point out in this vision statement. The first one is that it is a collaborative clinical research center. And um, I've been involved now in this uh, development of this for some time. And I'm really excited about the opportunities that each of these three partners can bring to this initiative. We all bring different strengths, um, but I think together that makes this center much more likely to be successful. The second thing is that it really is focused on Northern remote rural and indigenous communities. These communities are different than the ones that are in the lower mainland. Uh, we have different challenges, uh, different processes, and this center is really being set up to help address issues that are relevant to the Northern and remote rural communities. And then the last one is something that uh, Dr. Olson mentioned as well, is that people in the North really do deserve access to clinical trials. And this uh, center will do that for them. So that's the, uh, the overall vision of the center, truly collaborative and truly meant uh, developed uh, and meant to be directed at people in the North. And over to Julia. Great, thanks so much, Kathy. Um, and so I don't wanna be repetitive. I think we've kind of talked about this, but really it, it is about being relevant to those Northern rural, remote and indigenous peoples. We wanna focus on, and be responsive to the emerging needs um, in the north, and um, you know within the available resources that we have. So we want to, you know, we're going to be starting off small. We currently have um, a single office. You can see the photograph here of our office at UHNBC, um, and so we do have limited resources. But we want to expand and grow across the northern health region. We want to support researchers in other areas. This does not need to be um, Prince George centric by any means. We want to grow and expand across our entire region. Region, but we do still need additional resources. Um, as Rob and, uh, and some of the examples that uh, Dr. Winwood um, explored there, we need some dedicated support for uh, clinical research coordination. We need dedicated lab and pharmacy staff to support research, um, quality management, research nursing resources. You know, these are anticipated to be partially cost recovered through study budgets, but it's going to require some upfront injection of funding to get these started. And so we are really looking for potential industry partners who might be interested in supporting further growth of this of this center. Um, so it's exciting. We're just we're just starting off. It's very new. We're starting small, but um, we're pretty hopeful that uh, we'll be able to expand over time. And so I think I'm passing it back to Paul. I think you are. Yeah. So. Really, this goes back to um, Julia's first slide where she talked about the social engagement. We've done a lot of work um, engaging with various partners and have a lot more work to do, but we want to make the point that we know not just is this built on the partnership between the three institutions, but we know that we need to continue to build partnerships with uh, various other uh, institutions and organizations that are relevant to health research in the North, including RCCBC, PHSA, as Rob said, Divisions of Family Practice for UBC, Chair in Rural Health, and perhaps most importantly is with Indigenous partners, and that includes uh, the, the uh, First Nations Health Authority, the National Collaborating Centre, the UBC Centre for Excellence in Indigenous Health, and we know we have to build those partnerships if we want to do research with Indigenous peoples in the North, which I suspect is uh, where we will, uh, or, you know, where our faculty will want to do some of their research. So I'm going to hand it back, I think, to, is it Julia or Kathy next? I think this is over to Kathy. Oh, Kathy. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. So this is the governance structure that we have currently come up with. And because of the true collaboration, the governance committee is made up of the three sort of uh, VP level research leads at the three institutions. And there is, uh, we're currently recruiting for a center director who will report directly to that governance committee. The direction and decisions of the center director and the governance committee will be informed by a steering committee. And, um, and also there will be a number of center staff that will support that. We're looking at different ways to engage uh, indigenous people in this uh, center as well. And most likely that will be some sort of an advisory committee. 
um, but that is still a work in progress. I also want to point out on the operational side, so there's a line coming from the Vice President of Quality and Planning Northern Health down to the Regional Director of Research Evaluation and Analytics, because my understanding, and this is not my area, but when clinical research happens and certain operational things have to take place, uh, drawing blood is, is one example, and so there has to be that connection to the uh, Northern Health Clinical Research Operations Committee um, as well, that will help inform, again, some of the decisions and the directions that we're going um, and uh, what the governance committee is, is deciding on. So that's the, uh, the governance model as it currently stands. Great. And I think this is our final slide. We just wanted to kind of give you a bit of a flow through of what this might look like in practice. So we would have researchers who have a great idea, they have a topic area or a question that they want to ask as researchers, and they approach this Northern Center for Clinical Research. If that idea is outside the scope, it's not about clinical research or, or biomedicine, then we would connect them to one of our other partners within that larger ecosystem of research in the North. For example, the HRI, the Health Research Institute might be a great place for them to go. If it is within the scope of the NCCR, then we would help them and it could be help with study design. Uh, you know, we might have a new clinician who doesn't have a lot of training, uh, formal training in research, but is interested in, in getting involved in research. So we can help them with study design, uh, with ethical and institutional approvals, guide them through that process, understanding the regulatory environment. So the clinical research manager that we have always says her job is to keep people out of orange jumpsuits. <laughs> we want to make sure people are abiding by the regulations, um, you know, contracts and finance, and then study coordination. So the idea is that individually, researchers might not have um, the need for an entire FTE or full-time person supporting their coordination, but together, if everyone, um, you know, coordinates together and, and shares, um, shares a coordinator, for example, then we can uh, be more efficient and effective that way. So that is the vision that we have and, and we're excited to get started on. And I think we wanna just open it up for any questions or, or dialogue. I'm not seeing anything in the in the Q and A or in the chat. I don't think that's a question. But we really thank you for your time, um, and uh, it's been a great opportunity to to share with you today. Thank you very much. That's a really really exciting and interesting initiative, and I'd love to follow up um, with you on that um, at a later at a later time. I have quite a few questions, but I'll, I'll defer them till after. Um, and I want to thank all of our speakers, Sarah, Rob, Julia, Kathy, Paul, great um, presentations. I have to honestly say this is one of my favorite showcase series. And I really look forward to hopefully next year having it in person. Although, of course, one of the advantages of it being virtual is that we, we get to showcase um, the breadth of what's happening in Prince George to a broader community. So um, thank you all for taking the time. Um, I'd like to thank um, our event partner, Michael Smith Health Research BC, for supporting the event and our speaker partners, Clinical Trials BC and the University of Northern British Columbia. Without your support, these events would not be possible. Um, we do have a, at every uh, one of our events, we talk about the events that are coming up. Uh, today was our last one for 2000, uh, 2021. Um, so upcoming, we have our Gardner um, webinar, Gut Peptides Drive Therapeutic Innovation, which we're really looking forward to having one of the esteemed Gardner speakers coming to uh, speak at that. We have our annual, our third annual Career Connect Day presented by BioTalent Canada on January 21st. This is a virtual event, and the objective of this is to connect uh, researchers, uh, academic employers um, together. Uh, so hopefully, uh, many of you will be able to join that. On January 27th, we have our McCarthy Spotlight Speaking Series, which will be on oncology this year. Or this next one. In February, we have Access to Innovation, um, which is uh, held in mid-February. And then March, we have a new invest, um, invest in the West presented by Amplitude Ventures. 
Um, so hope you can join us. All of these events are intended to be virtual, so they are always open for everyone, but it's certainly a lot easier for people um, to access it when they're virtual. Someday we will record, we will return to in-person events, but as of right now, we're continuing in, uh, in the virtual space. And uh, with that, again, I'd like to thank all of our supporters. Um, you know, we are very, very fortunate, especially during the pandemic, that so many organizations, academic research institutions, and industry partners, local and global, have uh, continued to support our organization and more broadly support the life sciences ecosystem. So a huge thank you to them. And um, with that, I would like to wish you all happy holidays and also draw your attention to, we have partnered with the Red Cross to, um, uh, to do a fundraising campaign with, with uh, the life sciences sector, where um, as you would be aware, the Red Cross is actively raising money for flood and disaster relief in, uh, in the lower mainland and the interior. And we have uh, created a page on our website for people to be able to donate to the Red Cross through that. And one of our leaders within the life sciences sector, Doug Jansen, has agreed to match funds up to $10,000. So if you want to make a donation to the Red Cross, if you do it through us, Doug Jansen will contribute, as well as the federal government is also matching funds up until December 26th. So um, that is available on our website, and I think Ryan just put it into the chat as well. And with that, happy holidays to everybody, and uh, we hope you have a safe and healthy holiday season.